welcome you guys out to our women's Bible study. Um, I was speaking with my husband just about just the heart of this ministry and the women, and um, I learned something early on in ministry, and that is you can't complain about something unless you're going to do something about it. So in that sense, I, I shared with my husband, I, I was like, I really just want to sit with the women and just talk with them and just have, like, you know, when we all get together and we just sit and we just talk and we teach and we share on you know, being a wife or being a mother or feeling overwhelmed or just stressed out about life. I, I think that we need a place where we can just come together and have Bible studies and then afterward do a Q&A and just talk about different things that are going on in our life. So that's what we're going to do here today. Um, I'm going to teach for about 30 to 40 minutes and then after that we're going to go into a Q&A where if there's a, something just on your heart and you just want to ask openly, um, we pretty much kick all the guys out so we can just talk about what we want to talk about with the exception of Aaron and Carlos. They won't tell us that. So, um, again, I just want to welcome you guys here, and we're going to go ahead and get into prayer. I know some people got stuck in traffic and all that good stuff, but we're not going to think about that. We're not going to think about what happened today, what happened this week. We're not going to come in here stressed out about all the cares and all the worries. And I know as women, we do this sometimes. We just worry, and we meditate on the wrong thing over and over again, and stress out to the point we actually physically get sick. I used to know. I mean, I know that. I used to get ulcers from stress when I was younger. Isn't that crazy? Who knows what I was stressing out about? I didn't even have any real issues. But I think as women, sometimes we tend to meditate on the wrong thing. And that's why the Word of God tells us to meditate on the right things. So um, why don't we all just stand up and get into the presence of the Lord and just welcome him into our heart. Just welcome him into our life. Just open up your mouth and just worship him. God, we just welcome your presence into this place. Oh, God, you're so faithful and you're so good. God, we just first and foremost cast all of our care onto you because you care for us. God, you're so good and you're so welcome in this place. There will be no uh, there will be no ungodly spirit blocking your presence in this place, God. We welcome you in here just to flow through every single aisle, just to change our hearts. We're not just out here just because we came out here expecting something from you, God. We come out here expecting that you're going to change our hearts from the inside out. God, we want our hearts to look more like yours. We want to be more like you, Jesus. God, you're so good and you're so faithful. I thank you for all the women that are here, God. I pray that their lives are, are just set on you and that they're focused on you and established and rooted and grounded in you. I pray that they trust you, God. I pray that they're like those trees that's planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in their season. I pray, God, that every time the tests and trials come in their life, that they don't pick up their tree and they move to another place, God, but they just sit there and they trust you through the hard times, through the good times, through the bad times, through the beautiful times. God, I pray that their hope is in you and not in this world. I thank you, God, that their value and their worth comes from you and you alone. It doesn't come from being a stay-at-home mom. It doesn't come from not having a job. It doesn't come from not having degrees, but it comes from the cross. God, you're so good and you're so faithful and you have not forgotten about us. God, we just worship your name. We just love your presence, your sweet, sweet presence, God. Oh, God, we love you so much. We just love your presence, God. We're just so thankful that you woke us up this morning. We're thankful for a new day to worship you with all of our life. God, teach us your way. I pray that, God, that, that everything we study about, it comes out the way that you want it to, Lord. I'm just a vessel that, that's willing to be used by you, God. This is not about personality. It's all about you. It's all about your name. So I just thank you for today. I thank you for this moment. I thank you for this God moment where I can just sit in your presence, God, and just soak in it. And I pray, God, that everything that you poured into me in my study will come out exactly how it in a physical world. But guess what? Our tests are not physical. Our tests are spiritual. And I think sometimes we forget that the enemy is roaring around like a lion looking for somebody to destroy. Even in this room, we see people moving around, but if God opened up our eyes for just a moment 
into the spiritual realm. You would see, you would see angels just worshiping in this place. And you would see demons waiting for you to walk outside the door. And the thing is, I think that sometimes we forget that the enemy is coming around to attack us. And, and then when an enemy comes in and attacks, it's like we, we're almost surprised. We're like, we're surprised that we got attacked. What are you doing when the attacks and the tests come your way? And that's what we're going to talk about today, the battle to truly trust Jesus. I feel like some of us, we come to church, we get the word, and we get excited about the word, but then as soon as we leave the door, we do exactly what we want to do. God is saying, like, okay, if we don't do this, if we're going to be partners, if we're going to walk this thing out, I'm going to need you to start passing some of these tests and develop and grow and go from the milk of the word to the meat of the word. We've got to get back to this place, and I believe that one of the greatest areas that the enemy uh, attacks us in is doubt. It's like that doubt. I'm trying to get us to doubt what God called us to do who God called us to be. Even in studying this message today, I was studying and I was like, God, I don't want to do this. I mean, what, I mean they're, they're not going to want to hear anything that I have to say, God. I mean, I mean, why can't, why can't I just sit in the back? You know what I mean? I, I didn't ask to be a preacher or anything. It's just my husband kind of threw the microphone in my hand and told me to go up there. God, I mean, why? Why? And it's almost like the enemy does it. And I, I say that to, to let you know that I'm not even exempt from those attacks that are coming about self-doubt, about your purpose, about what God has called you to do. And even in my own life, I have to be so intentional about saying, God, you know what? I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to be moved by my feelings. What if I came in here and was like, you know, you know, my doubt came into my heart today and it paralyzed me and I'm not going to be preaching today. I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit on in the back. You look at me like, no, I came out in the rain through traffic and through everything. You think you're about to go up there and you're about to preach to me. <laughs> and I say the same exact thing to you in your own life. You can't stop doing what God is telling you to do because, you're, because of doubt, because of fear, because of worry, because you feel like you don't have a purpose, and because you say, oh, you know, I don't really, you know, it's just things are hard right now. No, I need you to continue to press in and do what God is telling you to do. We can't quit. Because things are hard. We can't quit because we're being tested. We, quit. we can't quit because we don't see the other side of it. In the midst of the battle, we have to be so determined to trust God and stop taking advice from a fallen angel. Some of y'all are entertaining Satan too much. Instead, y'all need to start talking back to him. What well, we're not going to do today. <laughs> you ain't going to talk to me today. You give the worst advice. You're a liar. You've been a liar from the beginning, and I'm not going to entertain you. I'm not going to talk to you. If you're having a rough day on, on your job, why are you going back and forth with the enemy? And if the enemy could even be using some of your coworkers to attack you. And some of y'all are just sitting there just getting mad and gossiping about them. And this fight is spiritual. It's not physical. So what do you do when the attack comes your way? Are we doing what the Bible says to do? Or instead, are we going into carnal means? Well, you know, let me tell you what so-and-so did. Are we going to pray for them? Because you know where she going. It's like, why? At what point did you crown yourself God where you can start sending people to hell? Instead, why don't you respond lovingly to that coworker that is off the chain? I know in my own life, I, I used to work at um, a, a record label, and you're probably like, why did you work there? I went there and I told the Lord I wanted to go there and tell people about Jesus, and you know, he told me to go. So I went and I took an internship, and it was so hard at that job. Like, I mean, when I felt like I was tested every single day, I had the craziest bosses on this entire earth. My boss, I work 80 hours a week, and so mind you, I'm just exhausted and drained and all that other stuff. And I'm up here working, it's on to the Lord. I'm trying to be nice to these heathens. I'm trying to be loving, I'm trying to be kind. And my boss comes walking down the hallway, and she was really short, so she'd just be like this, and just <laughs> cussing me out from way down the hall. I mean, every curse word you could think about. Why? Because, you know, something wasn't in her journal, you know, or in her little binder, you know, and, you know, because I missed it because she forgot to tell me about it. I mean, just simple stuff like that. And it's in those tests and in those trials, I learned to trust God. And I remember going up to her at 11 o'clock at night and saying, um, you know, do you need anything? I'm on my way out the door. You ain't got no man. Why are you going home? Because it's 11 o'clock at night and I'm tired <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm, I'm ready to go home. And, she was like, nope, not ready for you to leave yet. So I would go sit back down, and the Lord would speak to me. He would say, Heather, just work as though you're working on me. And I'm like, God, this is so hard. There's these, there'd be times where I just tears that going down my eyes. And 11 o'clock at night, the Lord would say, Heather, go into your, go and ask your boss if she wants any food. I said, God, it's so late. I'm so tired. And he's like, am I not the one that refreshes you? Am I not the one that rejuvenates you? All right, Lord, I'll go ask her. And I go and ask her, do you need anything to eat? 
yes, I would like this, this, and this, and they don't deliver, so you have to go pick it up. Okay. So I would go and I would work all these different places, and it's in those moments where I truly learn to trust God. It's like we get hit on our jobs, we get hit in our lives, and we get frustrated and we get down, and we begin to take life into our own hands, and we stop responding lovingly. I look back at that season in my life when I worked in New York City and it was really hard and I just didn't understand. And The Lord said to me, he's like, I'm using this to prepare you for where I've called you to go. And a lot of us, we can't see that far ahead because we're walking by sight. We're not walking by faith. So a lot of us are, are frustrated with where we are because we don't see what's on the other side of it. But if we saw what's on the other side of it, some of you might be discontent in your current season because you're so focused on what's next. So God is saying, I need you to trust me right now, today, and where you are in your life. And I, will, and I will take you and reveal to you what's next after that. Six months after I left that job, my boss called me and asked me to come and pray with her. And she gave her life to Christ. And she said to me, I was on my way to hell in the music industry. And God showed me what the true love of God was. She's like, you were so nice to me. I was so mean to you. She's like, I would cry sometimes about the way I was just so harsh and so mean to you. But then I had no idea that God was going to use that season to prepare me for where I am now and in ministry. Because guess what? The sheep bite. <laughs> sheep can bite sometimes. People, people can hurt you. Y'all know about church hurt. But the thing is that stuff prepared me for where I am now. So some of us are trying to squirm out of the test that we're in right now because we want out. We want out. God, I want out. But there's this battle going on. And, and God is saying, I need you to trust me. Why don't we flip over to Matthew 6. Some of us are getting worried about simple things. I mean, tests that we've passed before. Matthew 6, and it's going to be 6 and 31. Matthew 6 and 31. So don't worry about these things. Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Let's go back to verse 31 and read it again. So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Who will we get married to? How long am I going to be single? When is my husband going to change? When am I going to get into school? When is my mind going to get right? Jesus, because you know I'm a train wreck. When, when is my bank going to stop getting hit with negative fees? When am I going to have freedom in my heart, God? When are my children going to change? Because they are driving me up the wall. When is this? You see, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But God is saying your heavenly Father knows all your needs. Seek me first the kingdom of God above everything else, and he will give you everything that you need. An enemy is attacking some of you guys with so much doubt and so much worry. And God is saying, I need you to trust me. Stop worrying about all these things that the world is worrying about. Do you see? It's a distraction. It's a distraction to get you from being focused on the Lord to being focused on the things of this earth. The enemy is trying to have you so messed up. And what happens when you're distracted and you're worried and you're in fear? You can't help that coworker that you don't like because your perspective is already set towards you. It's selfish. Life is all about you because you want your stuff, because you want your promotion. You're mad that you got a promotion, and you're gossiping about her, but God didn't even tell you to go to that job. He didn't even want you there. Or he doesn't want you there for a season, but to show you that he provides for you and not man. So your coworker might depend on man to take care of her, but God is saying, I take care of you. And you ain't ready for no promotion because your character's still messed up. You want the promotion. You want the worldly things. You want the physical things that you can see. But I'm trying to teach you so much, something so much greater. And that is to truly trust me with all of your life. It's to trust me with your bank account. It's to trust me with being married. It's to, it's to trust me with your husband. To trust me with your single life. To trust me with every single aspect of your life. Why are you trying to hold on to every piece of it? At some point, you must recognize that you do a bad job figuring out your life. You do a bad job of picking men. Can we just, can we, can we raise our hand to that? Let's stop acting like we're perfect in this place. Like y'all ain't, you know, pick every godly man, girl, that's a lot. <laughs> like you love your husband and you submit to him as on to the Lord. Because you know in church it's easy to act like y'all are all happy and it's love, girl. Hold on, sweetheart, one second, baby. Hold on, one second, okay. And you get in the car, 
Why you slamming her? Why you talking that girl at church like that? I saw the way you was looking at her. And he's like, I just handed her my envelope for the offering. I, it wasn't even that thing. At your job, just me. Just me. But what's in you is pouring out of you. And God is saying, I want you to trust me. When you leave those doors, you come in here and you put on this happy face, like everything's so perfect and everything's so great, but you gotta let me teach you my ways. I can teach you how to submit to your husband. Wait, what? Huh? God, I, I ain't got no, I mean, I don't know how to do all that. And I mean, Heather sits up there and talk about it. It's so easy for her to do, honey. That's a lie. That's a lie. It's been a whole lot of tests and trials. And I learned to submit to my boss, that one boss, to treat me like crap is on to the Lord. And then, over the years, I've learned to develop and just love people beyond the way they treated me. And then guess what? When you get married, you do the same thing. My old boss prepared me for my marriage. My husband has a strong personality, and it's great. He's very much a commandment, very much a leader, very much a strong man. And I'm thankful for him. I am so thankful for him. But I wasn't ready for him years ago. I wasn't prepared. Because number one, I didn't, I didn't pass no test in my life. All I had was, you know, a degree and some lipstick. I ain't, I ain't passing up the spirit. I, I had no fruit of the spirit. You see what I'm saying? I had no self-control. I, I would have popped off at the mouth at him at, at, at a moment's notice. I had no self-control. I did what I wanted to do. You ain't going to tell me what to do. I needed to go through those seasons of development to prepare me for where I am now. And I'm thankful that I learned to trust God when I didn't understand in those moments. Because it's going to help you later on. And some of you guys are just sitting there. It's like there's this boxing ring going on, and there's this fight going on, and this fight to trust God. It's a fight to trust God, and then the enemy comes, and he hits you with losing your job. And then doubt comes in. Well, you know, God's forgotten about me. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't love me. And then immediately insecurity comes into your heart, and you feel like, God, you know, I'm not enough. I'm not enough. I feel like I'm inferior. I don't feel good about myself. And then another blow. Your boyfriend breaks up with you. So then you're like, well, dang, he don't want me. The job didn't work out. Nothing else is going on. And then your family calls you, and they're arguing with you about why, why, are you, why are you in that state? You need to move back home. All these tests are coming your way. All these tests are coming your way. And it's like these stages that the enemy, I believe, comes and attacks us. It's first the feeling of insecurity. And then two, you all of a sudden, you get this lack of peace because now you don't feel like you're enough. And then fear comes in. It's that what if? What if, what if this doesn't happen? What if I don't accomplish anything? What if I'm a stay-at-home mom for the rest of my life? What if I can't get a job? What if this? What if that? And then lastly, depression begins to sink into your heart. And these are the stages of what happens when you just don't decide not to trust God. Feeling of insecurity, the lack of peace, resulting in fear, and then depression. It's Satan's plan to get you distracted. Satan simply, he just wants you out of the way. He don't care about you. He just wants you out of the way. He wants you to come to church and come to a church building to just show up. He wants you to have no power. He doesn't want you to live this thing. He just wants you to sit and listen to anybody else that just feeds your fancy. That's why people have church hop. I don't like them because they talk too much about this and stuff and tell me what I can't do. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 20. I want to look at a story of somebody who was attacked and how they fought the battle of trusting in the Lord. 2 Chronicles 20. in verse 1. Alright, so pretty much what's happening here, I'm just going to um, summarize a couple, a couple things real quick. Um, actually, we can go, to, go down to verse 3, but pretty much what happened was, uh, the messengers came to Jehoshaphat, who's a king, and said, we're about to get attacked by this massive army. And Jehoshaphat, they have this small village, so they're, they're looking like, okay, we don't have enough people to fight against this big army. Verse 3, Jehoshaphat was terrified by the news and begged the Lord for guidance. So at this moment, he just gets this news that him and all of his, all of his army is going to get killed, pretty much, and wiped out. So what did he do? He was terrified by the news. He begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everybody in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Isn't that amazing? Jehoshaphat, he called everybody to fast. He got all the leaders together. He said, okay, we're being tested. We're being attacked. So what do you do when an attack comes your way? Do you immediately try to figure it out? Call the bank. Call your mama and them. 
let me go get a deal. Let me borrow some money. Let me get some direction. What should I do, Mom? No, or do you, do you go and do you cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, what do we do? Let's get all my friends. Come on, let's fast and pray and see what God wants us to do. Let's go to verse 5. Josephat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord. He prayed, Oh God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are the ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty, and nobody can stand against you. Oh our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people, Israel, arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people are settled here and built this temple to honor your name. So pretty much he's just going and he's saying, you know, God, he's just putting God in remembrance, essentially, of, of, of Jehoshaphat in the village. Like, they're about to wipe us out. We need your help. Verse 9, whenever we are faced with any calamity, such as war, plague, famine, um, we come and stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us, and you will rescue us. Isn't that, some, isn't that amazing? He got everybody together, and he's like, he cried out to God, and he declared, you will rescue us. You will save us. You will, you will take care of us. So what do you do when you get tested? Do you say that to God, or do you immediately feel defeated? I don't know what I'm going to do. But I, I feel forgotten. I feel like God don't love me. God, like, where did that come from? Who, did you give, who have you been talking to? What have you been pouring into your spirit? Where did you get that from? Because when you're spending that time with God and you're in his presence and you're intentional about trusting him, you're not gonna you're not gonna immediately go there in your head. Instead, you're gonna say, God, you're gonna rescue me. You're gonna take care of me and you have my back. So let's re keep reading. Let's re let's get down to 15. Um, so all the men are in there, they're praying, they're, they're fasting, and then one of the men stand up and they say, I have a word from the Lord. And he said, listen to all the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but it's God's. Tomorrow, march out against them, and you will find them coming up the ascent of these at the end of the valley that opens up into the wilderness of Jeru. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions and stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you. O oh, people of Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow. The Lord is with you. How powerful is that, y'all? Like, he's saying, you don't even need to fight. Take your positions. And if you keep reading down, he's essentially, uh, after consulting the people, it's verse 21, the king appointed singers, praise leaders, to walk ahead of the army and just to worship. So they pretty much sang out to God, and the armies, in turn, went and fought each other and killed each other. And they just sat there and watched. How, to me, that's just so powerful. They got hit with attack. They gathered everybody together and said, we're going to fast and pray. We're going to pass this test. God, you rescue you, us. You take care of us. You have our back. You love us. And then they said, God said, you don't even need to fight. Take your positions. And some of y'all are fighting way too hard in your life. You're fighting way too many battles that God never told you to fight in the first place. You're, you're, you're battling that inferiority, battling that insecurity, battling, battling jealousy, battling all these things where God is saying, I have a place for you in the body of Christ. Why are you so concerned about what everybody else is doing? If you truly trust me and you know that I am God, that I have a place for you, and there's a season that I need you in right now, but I need you to trust me. I love that they got together and fasted and prayed. What are you doing when your friends get, get, get together and ask you to fast and pray? Do you even fast anymore? Do you know fasting is a spiritual discipline? Because like I said in the beginning, it's a spiritual, it, we're, we're spiritual beings, but we live in a physical place. We have to fight at times, or we have to fight spiritually, right? So because we do, but nobody, no, none of us have any spiritual discipline because we do what we want to do. Our flesh leads our life, and that's the beautiful thing about fasting. What fasting does is it, you, you essentially have, your flesh has to bow down to the spirit when you're fasting. So instead of your flesh rising up, you say, no, no flesh, we're not going to do that because we submit and we focus on the Lord, and we're not going to do that. For example... Your flesh screams, I want donuts for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. No flesh, we're not going to do that because we're going to fast from donuts this week. It's a stronghold. It's obviously an area that we have some trouble in. Let's go ahead and fast from it. And then you're going to feel your flesh rise up and scream at you. I want sugar. I want white sugar. I want donuts. I want Krispy Kremes. I want unhealthy things. And then you get the word out. It says, man lives by more than bread alone, but every word of the living God. 
And then as you're fasting, as you're spending time with God, you know, God, I'm not going to talk to my ex. I'm not going to talk to different people on the phone. I'm going to go ahead and fast for a week or so. Let me just sit before you and, and just spend time with you. And then all these people are going to call you, and your flesh is going to want to be distracted. It's going to want to rise up and say, pick up the phone. Just call. They need you. They need you got to talk to them. you got to see what's going on. They, I'm sure they need you. No, they don't. That's your flesh screaming that it wants to do what it wants to do. And for a lot of us, our flesh is leading our life. And that's why we don't really trust God. Because... Whenever you want to do something, you just do it. Whenever you want to buy something, you just buy it. Whenever you're hungry, you just pick it up and eat it. You don't care if it's poisoning your body. You don't care if, if it's poisoning your spiritual life. You just want to do what you want to do whenever you want to do it. That's why it's okay for you to go watch garbage television just because your flesh wants to watch it. You can watch garbage television. You can listen to whatever type of music you want to listen to just because you have no conviction because your flesh leads your life. And that's the beautiful thing about fasting is that fasting has to bow down to the spiritual world because it's like... I remember when I would flat fast all the time when I first got saved, and I needed to fast a lot. I probably fast about 300 days of that first year I got saved because I knew my flesh wanted sex. Let me just keep it real. It wanted sex. It wanted a relationship. It wanted to do what it wanted to do. So I would constantly, I would, I would eat maybe one meal a day, and I would sit before the Lord, and I would read my Bible, and I would study it, and I'd be like, God, pour into me. Show me your word. Show me your way. I have to trust you, God, and I, I must live by this word, God, and not what I see. I believe that. I believe that you called me with such a purpose, and I can't afford to be led by my feelings and my emotions in my flesh. So I'm constantly, I tell my flesh, oh, you're going to shut up today. That's what you're going to do. I mean, people probably thought I was crazy, because I would talk to myself. I'd be like, what you're not going to do today is you're not going to crave soda. You're not going to crave, you know, whatever, whatever happened. You're just trying to make me a vegan. I'm not telling you to make you no vegan, vegan fast or whatever. I'm just saying. We look at fast and we're almost like, you just try to take away my meat. It's not even about that. You have to go before the Lord and say, God, this is a spiritual thing. If Jesus himself fasted, how come I don't fast? Why, why do I think it's not important? It's because we're in a generation that's tweet me, answer me, quick, I need this, I need my answer now, 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 now. We no longer sit before the holy God and say, God, teach me your ways. Show me what you want me to do. God, I must beat and discipline my flesh because my flesh wants to do what it wants to do. But a lot of us are like, look, God's going to answer. He's just going to do it anyway. So he can just do what he wants to do. Isn't that amazing? We're just so lax about our, our walk with God. It's not even, there's no fire in our belly anymore. We're more concerned and we have more, we're more energized about running to, we got to get to work on time because I ain't trying to get fired because they're trying to mess with my paper. It's like we get more, we have more reverence for our, our jobs and our coworkers than we do God. So I love this story of Jehoshaphat, and I always go back to it because some of you guys, I believe, are getting hit with battles in your life. And I'm asking you, how are you responding to those battles that are coming your way? Are you truly trusting in the Lord? Can you say that you really trusted in God? Well, Heather, you don't know my husband, but I do know, I do know God, and he did tell us to submit to our husbands as unto the Lord. Not to anything illegal, I tell you, but he's probably not telling you to do nothing illegal. You're just being rebellious in your heart. Let's just, let's just keep it real. It, it, well, what do I do about this? I just feel like I don't have purpose. I feel like I'm alone. Well, if you flip over to Jeremiah 1, it says that I've created you with purpose, and you have purpose in your mother's womb. And then you might feel like, God, I don't feel like, I, I don't feel like I'm worth anything. If you flip over to Jeremiah 29, 11, the thoughts that he thinks towards you are good, thoughts to prosper you, to give you an expected end. Do you see as you spend time in this word and you get before the Lord, he's going to show you the plans for your life. And he's going to give you instructions on how to do it. But so many of us are too lazy to sit before him. Instead, when we get hit with a test, we don't round up our friends to fast. Girl, I need you to pray for me. No, we round them up to gossip and to complain. How we're not happy. How we need this. How this needs to happen. How that. No. You need to look at your circle and the people that are around you when you get hit with tests and trials. Are those people pushing you closer to Jesus or are they pushing you away from him? We look at friendships and we're just like, oh, you know, she's been my friend forever. Well, is she correcting your walk with the Lord? Is she pushing you away from Jesus? And there's been friendships I've had to pull back from. I mean, we've been friends for years, but you know what? You're, you're messing with my walk with the Lord. And obviously, I, I can't afford to be around people that are influencing me more than Christ is influencing me. So ask yourself, when I'm being hit with a test, what do I do? What do I do? Do I immediately go to prayer? God, show me what you need me to do. Do I immediately think I need to fast? You know what, maybe social media has a strong hold on me. Maybe I need to let go of that for a season. Maybe I need to let go of pizza for a little bit. Maybe it has a strong hold on me. 
They didn't even let go of some of those TV shows because they had a stronghold on them. And that's the thing. You almost have to beat your flesh and say, flesh, no. You've been in a pattern that's not biblical. And maybe late at night when nobody else is looking, you open up and you go on your phone and you look up pornography. You might have to get rid of your phone. Oh, Heather, I can't get rid of my phone. Well, how bad do you want it? We have to ask ourselves, what, if, have I opened up a door to Satan in my life and given him an area in my heart? Or do I truly trust God and do I really live by these things? Um, I know even you know, in my marriage, there's times in my life where I sense that I just, I need to spend time with my husband. We're in one flesh and we get busy. My husband will be off running here, I'll be off running there. We'll be doing all these different things. And I'm like, we need to group back together. I need a date night. I need to look at your face and I need to talk to you. We need a vacation without kids. We need to go somewhere where it's just me and you and we look at each other and we remind each other of why we got married and how much we love each other. And yes, we're busy. And yes, we're doing different things. And I remember telling my husband how important it was to me that we pull away and we have that time. And I remember going to my prayer room and the Lord's like, I desire the same thing for you. He's like, you get so busy doing all these other things. I want your attention. I want you. I miss you. You know how that feels to have the Holy God say that he misses you? And I'm like, well, God, what have I placed before you? Because what happens is you're not going to trust somebody that you don't spend time with. And many of us just aren't spending that time with God. So when we get hit with those tests, we're not like Jehoshaphat that says, God, you're going to rescue me. You're, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna take care of me. Instead, our mind immediately goes, how am I going to figure this out? How am I going to do this? And God is saying in Galatians 3, 3, you started in the spirit, but are you so foolish? Now you're trying to figure out your life in the flesh. Stop trying to figure out your life in the flesh. I have a plan for you. I remember one time sitting in a, in a Bible study in, up in New York City, and I remember sitting there, and I was just, my hands were up to the Lord, and I was just worshiping him. And he said, are you going to let go of your life? And I was like, I'm in church. I came here on the train. I'm tired. What do you mean, Lord? I'm out here, you know. I'm giving you my sacrifice. And he said something along the lines of, your sacrifice is a stench to my nose. And I was like, well, dang. <laughs> and he said to me, I will blow your mind if you trust me. He said, the problem is you don't really trust me. You don't really trust me. You like your life way too much. You don't think that I can bring the, bring the husband to you so you're, you're going to go find and search your own. You don't think that I'm, I'm going to bring your purpose to pass. So you're, you're trying to rush off and doing stuff I never told you to do. You're going to accrue more debt at this college I never told you to go to because you're afraid that you won't make enough in your life one day. And I am your provider. I take care of you, Heather. Do you not know that I'm the holy God and I created the heavens of the earth and I have your back and I love you and I'm for you and I've not forgotten about you? And I'm sitting there and he's downloading on me and I'm in tears in my eyes. I'm like, God, what do you mean? I've been in church, I serve, I'm in all these ministries, God, I live for you. He said, no, you don't, you live for yourself and you tag my name to it. You say that you belong to me, but in your heart, it's, it's hardened. You're unforgiving. When people hurt you, you wish revenge on them secretly. You don't say it outwardly, but inside you laugh. You don't really trust me to bring your life to pass. But he said this, he said, Heather, I can guarantee you, if you let go of everything in your life right now, I will blow your mind. And, and it'll be greater than anything you've ever experienced in your life. And I remember I went home from that Bible study, and the first thing I did was broke up with my little boyfriend. I was like, let me get started on this path. Because I'm sick and tired. I know I was supposed to marry that fool in the first place. I knew he was pushing me away from God. And then I went and I examined my job. Am I supposed to be here? Then I went and I dropped out of grad school. I'm not supposed to be in grad school. I was in grad school to be a, a psych, like a psychologist. And I'm taking them classes, and it was a Christian private school, and I'm like, okay, what you saying ain't biblical, but praise the Lord. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Some of them schools, the Christian schools. But I'm sitting there, and, and the Lord begins to show me, Heather, you went to school because you thought worth and value came from degrees. And he's like, but I am going to put you in a position where you're going to be counseling a lot of people, and you don't even need that degree. You just need the Holy Spirit. He's like, but if you let the Holy Spirit teach you and lead you and guide you, I can show you the way that you're supposed to go. So I would go, and after I quit that Bible, after I quit grad school, I would take those five hours that I wasted every single night, because I took night classes, I took 12 credits, and I would go home, and I would sit and spend time with God, and spend time with God. And I said, you know what, Holy Spirit, you're the best teacher, teach me. 
I don't know this word, teach me. Show me your ways. I don't want to sit up here and depend on another man's word. I want to make sure what the preacher's saying is biblical. So let me sit before you and let, just teach me and instruct me. Download into my heart, God. I want my heart to look like yours. So I would fast and I would pray and I got hungry for God's word. I stopped hanging out with everybody because I didn't have time to just be hanging out all day and night. I don't think I'm better than you. I'm just working on some stuff in my life right now. I, there's a song, this Jeremy Riddle, Jer, Jeremy Riddle song that I always, I always reference. It says, tell your friends that this is where the party ends. Until you're broken for your sin, you can't be social. And that's how I felt. I felt like I can't, I can't sit up here and just hang out and, hey, girl, we're going to all these parties. I can't do all that stuff anymore. I believe that God has a call in my life. And Jesus is coming back. And what if he comes back and he, I see, and I stand before him one day and he's saying, what did you do with the time I gave you? Well, I was in grad school trying to get this degree, but I told you to leave. Why did you stay there? Because, you know, I wanted, I wanted money, but am I not your provider? Do I not take care of you? Why are you still in this relationship with this person I told you to get rid of? Why are you in that relationship with that person? If you're married, why do you treat your husband so bad? Do you not know that you guys are one flesh and you bashing him is bashing you? You guys are one flesh. Why would you tear down your own house? Ask yourself, what am I doing with the time that God has given me right now? Do I truly trust him with all of my life? Have I taken my whole life and laid it before him as a sacrifice and said, here, God, I surrender everything. What do you need me to get rid of? What, do you, what am I holding on to my life that's not you? Ask yourself, am I holding on to my past of how people used to see me? Maybe you were rejected, maybe you were hurt, maybe you were abused, and now you subconsciously carry that into every relationship. You think everybody's out to get you, everybody's out to hurt you. God wants to heal you from that. You can't hold on to that anymore. You can't avoid that relationship especially with women, and, and that's the thing I love about women and just getting together, just to so, show them, honey, you are beautiful. Yeah. And I'm secure enough in Christ to tell you that you're beautiful, and I don't think it, it is okay. Girl, you are fly. All my friends, we always say that, like, girl, you look good, honey. You are fly. Like, God has a plan for you. I don't care who has left you. I don't care who has rejected you, who has hurt you. You need to get around people like that. Who, who are you fighting this battle with? I believe that a lot of us are fighting it alone, and it's almost like we, we, we turn inward because we don't want to be transparent with anybody about anything because we don't truly trust God, and we don't truly trust that he healed those broken places in our heart. So are you like me on that Bible study probably about 10 years ago where the Lord just said, I need you to surrender it all. I need you to start walking this thing out and you really trust. I know you had a plan. I know you have a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is not me. I believe that there's so many gifts and so many talents in this room right now. And so many of us are quenching them, we're covering them because we feel like we're not enough. You're like how I felt when I was studying this message like, God, why? 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 I preach. You know what I mean? I'm thankful. Don't get me wrong. But there's times in my life where I'm just like, you know, God? I'm just a small town girl from Brooklyn, Michigan. I don't know where these people came from, and I don't even know why they came. And I know it's you, God, and that's what it is at the end of the day. It can't even be about you. You have to get you out of the way. God desires to use you, your past, and everything that's ever happened to you for his glory. But you have to let go of who you are to see that. And then as you let go, it's just one, one foot in front of the other. It's just a daily step. Just one step in front of the other one. All right, Holy Spirit, I'm overwhelmed with my schedule. What do I do? You're distracted. Okay, how am I distracted? Write it down. How am I distracted? You're distracted because you spend too much time on social media, too much time online shopping, too much time hanging out with your friends. You need to pull back. Okay, all right, got you. I'm going to do that. Also, you serve in way too many ministries at church. And a lot of us, we say, well, God, I'm serving you, but serving him does not take replacement of his relationship that you have with him. Some of us are replacing our relationship with God with serving at church. You can't do that. If I go around serving my husband, cleaning up, although he would probably absolutely love it, cleaning up nonstop, but never talking to him, never communicating with him, never telling him that I love him, not, not, never checking on him, babe, how you doing, are you okay? Some of us get so busy, 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 that we don't just sit before the Lord and say, all right, God, teach me, what, what, what am I supposed to know right now? And then you'll wake up, 
and God will give you instructions. You go to your job. I need you to go talk to um, your coworker. She's really battling the trust in me. And I need you to tell her that I love her and tell her that I've heard her cry and that I'm with her. Wait, God, why do you, dang, why do you, she don't think I'm deep. Just don't trust, just trust me. Just trust me. You gonna trust me? All right, God, I'm gonna trust you. Okay. All right, I don't know if you know Jesus or not, but <laughs> he told me to tell you that he loves you and he has a plan for your life. And just to trust him. And then you just see tears pour down her eyes. And she'll say, I told God this morning that I need a sign from him or I'm gonna quit altogether. Do you know that it's in those sweet moments with the Lord that you spend time in your quiet time, in your place with him, that he begins to instruct you over here? But if you're not spending time with him over here, how is he going to instruct you over here? He desires to lead your every step and to show you what you're supposed to do. So instead of complaining about that coworker and complaining about your job and complaining about your husband and complaining about all those things, why don't you get on your face and pray for them? I even had an opportunity as I was studying this. I felt like I needed to go talk to my husband about some things that I felt like he needed to know about. He's not in here, praise the Lord. <laughs> but I felt like, you know, my emotions were just kind of rising up, and I felt like, you know, I felt a way about something. So as I was studying, I remember I put my Bible down. I was like, let me go talk to him. Let me call him in his room real quick so I can download real quick on what he needs to do so I can focus on studying. I can't focus on studying. He needs to. I need to get this off my chest. So as I put my Bible down and I went to go to the door, the Lord said, get your Bible and go back upstairs. And I said, all right. <laughs> he, said, what? he said, your issue is this. It's not your husband. It's not your husband. You need to get on your face and spend time with me. It's your emotions. It's your feelings. It's all those things. You think it's everybody else is your issue, but what you really need to do is get on your face before me and let me lead and guide your life. I stood to this moment, obviously it's only been a couple hours, but I didn't go tell my husband what I felt like he needed to hear because my issue was bigger than my husband. It was me. I needed to go sit before the Lord and I went and sat, sat before him and he told me, he said, sometimes you just need to come vent to me. I think you need to open up your mouth and tell everybody what's on your mind about everything. As if they can solve your problems anyway. What would it solve? Me going to download on him. Nothing, except it would probably irritate him. Especially since my issue was spiritual, not physical. So what battles are you fighting right now? Isn't that ironic? I was studying a message about battling, and I got up and I was about to go fail the test. <laughs> it's just an example. Test come. Go see what the word has to say about it. If you don't know what the word has, it's not hidden in your heart. If you don't know what it has to say, then you might take life into your own hands. But at some point or another, that's got to get old. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this message on the battle to truly trust you. I pray, God, that we truly trust you in every area of our life. I believe, God, that you truly desire to blow our mind. And it starts with us taking a step of obedience. It starts with us making a decision that we're going to trust you and we're going to walk by faith and we're not going to walk by sight. God, you have planted eternity in our hearts and you have given us purposes while we're here. So while we're here, teach us, God, not to waste time with unhealthy and ungodly things that have no purpose. Show us what we're supposed to do. Lead and guide us on the path that we're supposed to be on, God. Show us that we really just need to trust you and walk by faith and not by sight. And show us, God, that it's not an overnight journey, but it's a one step in front of the other one where we make a decision that we are going to trust you and we're going to live this walk out. So I thank you, God, that our hearts are hardened to your word and that we don't crown ourselves as God over our life, but we make a decision to slow down and see what your spirit has to say about it. So we love you, God, and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.